but he also likes to be called Yoel Stepanik. <laughs> That's a very Russian name. <laughs> I can I picture know. you with those you wooden shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're running around in those crogs or whatever they're called. <laughs> <laughs> that is not it. Yeah. What is a crog? 100%. Right. Wooden the clogs. Clogs. And that's, look, that's I Holland. I brought the three of you together in a special moment. You're welcome. <laughs> Boop. Take two. All right. Let's do this again. Those no. Russian <laughs> crogs. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Okay, so close. Joel. And that's how the Beatitudes started an international incident. <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably. Uh, we offended the Holland. Yeah, Vladimir Putin is like, you, yeah. not, <laughs> you will not talk about our clogs that way. <laughs> they are crogs. They are crogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. You guys are very good at it. What <laughs> accent is that, <laughs> Jeff? Jeff has like one <laughs> multinational accent that he does every time. <laughs> The Hello, ladies and gentlemen, or maybe I should probably just say lady and gentlemen, based yeah. on the demographics of our crowd. Welcome to the Beatitudes, a podcast for Christian men, and well, and, and a growing number of women who are tuning in, so thank you for tuning That's in. That's right. But for Christian men seeking to grow in holiness with one another as we walk in authentic fraternity, you know, building each other up and having fun along the way because we take the faith seriously, but not ourselves. Uh, my name is Paul Kolker, and I am joined, as always, by my bro hosts with the mo hosts, yep. Nicholas Besner. What's going on, everybody? And Jeffrey Sheffieldine. This is a show for Christian men and Australians. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Shots fired. Actually, that's, the, I think that's there's, actually a, there's a Venn diagram there. That's actually our <laughs> second biggest I know audience. Some, I know non-Christians in Australia are enjoying this a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just, um, this is an ah, ecumenical moment. Got it. I see. It didn't you're, sound you're at all. one right. female listener is actually from Australia. That's We just really blew it. Oh, oh no. That actually makes better sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're joined again on our bonus edition episode by none other than properly pronounced name Joel Stepanek. And, very good, yeah. But he also likes to be called Yoel Stepanik. <laughs> That's a very Russian name. <laughs> I, I can I picture you with those Yoel wooden Stepanik. shoes. <laughs> yeah, you're running around in those crogs or whatever they're called. <laughs> <laughs> that is not it. Yeah. What is a crog? 100%. Right. Wooden <laughs> the clogs. 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 And that's, look, That's I Holland. I brought the three of you together in a special moment. You're welcome. <laughs> Boop. Take two. All right, let's do this again. Those no. Russian crogs. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Okay, so close. Joel. And that's how the Beatitudes started an international incident. <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably. Uh, we offended the Holland. Yeah, Vladimir Putin is like, you yeah. not. <laughs> you will not talk about our clogs that way. They are clogs. They are clogs. <laughs> no, but okay. You guys are very good at it. What <laughs> accent is that, <laughs> Jeff? Jeff has like one <laughs> multinational accent that he does every time. <laughs> It's kind of like that. Do you guys remember the the Yanny thing? It was like yeah. the uh, what was the other word? Oh, oh man, uh, Yanni, Lo Laurel, was, Laurel, and Yanni and Laurel. And yeah. it was like they were they were played at the same time, but that you heard whatever crazy. one. Yeah, that your accent. I live that. Your your accent is whatever one people are told it's supposed to be. Ahead My of internet's time. always broken. <laughs> That's it. Uh, well, speaking of internet, if you uh, if you are on the internet, um, which you are probably because of how podcasts work, um, go ahead and subscribe, uh, share the show, like the show. Please, uh, we're, we're growing, but we need your help to do it. So thank you for all of you who have already subscribed. Paul, I actually got us distributed in Cracker Barrel where you can take our tape from one Cracker Barrel to the next and listen to episodes of the Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> we're on tape? That is so I work, retro. I work hard on the show. <laughs> Yep, uh, you can also find all of our pictures distributed by Polaroid. So, uh, we've got Joel back here again, and speaking of the internet, uh, I hear you have some sort of crazy story involving said internet. Mm. Yeah, back in the day when the internet was young, mm. and you would dial into the internet oh, using yeah. your phone. Okay, let's all do our best impersonation of that noise right now. Everybody ready? All at the yeah. same time. Pick pick apart. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're, we're going to lose our audience anyway. So, yeah, everybody, the one Australian female listener just was like, Mom. No, nah, I'm out, that's man. Not, this that, is that's not how it sounded in no. Australia. Right. No, this is terrible. Oh, the, that's uh, British, sorry. Yeah, so uh, when I was, uh, we, we got, you know, the internet at our house, and it was dial-ups, it was very slow. But um, in that age of new internet, I was in middle school, and I was homesick from school one day, and it was not only the age of the internet, but it was the age when MTV, on their main channel, 
would play music videos. Oh, um, you're and old. so I know. <laughs> and so I'm at home and I'm sick and I've got music videos on MTV because I I you know I'm a teenager I love music and I love uh, heavy metal, hard rock, hip hop. And I was actually into a lot of negative music. Like my parents for a while were screening the CDs that I had because this was also the age before streaming music. So if you wanted to get music, you'd go and buy a CD. But uh, my parents would they would look at the CD, they'd listen to the music on it if you could sample it at the store. Because I was, I just was into really negative music, and it was mm-hmm. having an effect on me. Music has a profound oh, effect yeah. on us, right? Um, and this music video comes up from this group called the Black Eyed Peas, and it was called Joints and Jam, and it was unlike anything I had ever heard. It was organic underground hip hop, and was positive, and I was just really struck. The song was catchy, and so I went to my dial-up internet, and it made all the horrible sounds. <laughs> And I was like, I, I want to learn a little bit more about this band. Because on MTV, it was in, embedded in a bunch of music videos, and and then it was gone. And I couldn't find anything. I could find, like, bits and pieces. But what I found, I, I was excited about. And I my parents took me to the store to buy the that album. And when they listened to it, the music was positive, so they let me buy it. Um, and then I, I just was like, I, I think I'm going to make a, a fan website for this band. Because there's nothing online about them, and uh, I feel like people need to hear this music. So I make the website. And uh, it gets a little bit of traction, and then one day I get an email from the guitar player in the band, and he's like, "Hey, my name's George. We saw your website. Would love to like give you news about about the band." And I'm like, what? "No, no way. <laughs> this is not real. This is." And he's just, he leaves his phone number. You were the first person to ever get punked. <laughs> so I call my friend Ben, and I'm like, "Ben, I think I don't know if this is real, but I can't do this alone. It's some weirdo. Let's do a three way call." Which in that time cost money to do three way calls sure, as well. Gosh, yeah. And uh, I'm like, we got to do this. So, like, if it's weird, you're like, you're there. He's like, okay, call him. It's the guy. It's the re- so he, we have this conversation. He gives me some news. And then uh, Will Adams, who's Will I Am, he's the front man for the band, he also emails. He's like, hey, here's my AOL Instant Messenger handle. I hope that for any millennial and <laughs> Gen Xer, this is just an absolute walk yes. down wow. uh, your childhood. So I we start talking over Instant Messenger, and pretty soon I'm talking to one of their girlfriends who is a radio DJ in L.A., and they're feeding me news, and we're building up this website, and other fans are connecting. And we have this little kind of empire to this group that we all love, the Black Eyed Peas. But I'd go to school, and this is like mind-blowing to me. And I'm telling my friends, and they're like, who is that? Because it's 2000, and it's 2000. And one, it's 2000. Yeah, so it's not 2008, and it's they weren't not, 2000 and late? No, exactly. They yeah. are not popular yet. <laughs> okay. And so all my friends, they could care less, or they could not care less about this. Yeah, They're yeah, like, yeah. We, we just don't, you, stop talking about Black Eyed Peas and Soul Food, and you're weird. Yeah, but we're can, into Ben Folds 5 and I, all that right now. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, eventually, I, m- I met the band. They played Summerfest in Milwaukee, and nice. I got backstage passes. It's actually the only no time I was way. ever grounded in my life was because I went backstage Worth with this band. And didn't tell my parents where I was. Like oh. they, and it's 1 a.m. at this festival, and their almost freshman boy has not emerged from the Summerfest grounds. I mean, my dad thought, I, now as a parent, sure, I would have, oh, yeah. I don't know what I would have done. But he was, <laughs> like, I was with two friends. They came with me. I just did ditch them, went backstage. And they came running like, dude, your dad is going to kill you. Mm-hmm. He punched a mailbox. They're like, we, we watched him punch a postal, <laughs> a postal mailbox. Because he was so frustrated, and now um, he's bleeding, so he's extra mad. So I, I got grounded, and the the tangential story is when I was grounded, I recorded my first and only rap album, um, <laughs> which still exists. And we're going to play it. For- no, <laughs> we're, no, we're not. Oh, sorry, um, sorry for the bait and switch. But it was the first time uh, that I really had was so passionate about something that I had to share it. Yeah. And so um, I had just this tremendously formative experience. Uh, Will Adams, I was like, give me some advice, man. Like, what's some advice? He's like, hey, always, always stay moving. Always keep moving. No matter what's going on, like, you, you stay in motion, keep moving. And I remember that. The tragedy is I got into high school and then got interested in girls and sports and kind of let the, the website go by the wayside. And they got a new official site, and I kept in touch with them. And then they put out this single called Where is the Love with Justin Timberlake and blew up. Mm-hmm. Oh. Just blew up. Oh. And I often think back, and I'm like, if I would have stuck with that, I think my life journey would be a little bit different. Wow. You know? Like, any uh, still communication in any recent time period with, with said no. band? Yeah. Sometimes I think about, like, because now they're, they're, they're not They do as, watch this show, so if you want to say something they, to Will they, I Am. Will Adams, if you hear this, just yeah. you changed my life. Um, 
<laughs> I sometimes do think I'm like if I, maybe I go to a show and they're small enough now that maybe I could like say you remember that kid from Wisconsin. That's me. Who ran your website. That's me. <laughs> I'm that um, guy. But it was it was transformative. But in hindsight, what was so cool about that moment for me is that it was my first brush with like evangelization. Yeah. And like actually primed me for the career and the ministry that I would get into. Because I, I then you went through high school, I went into college, and I did what a lot of people do, I think, in college, which is I said, What is what is the intersection between my intelligence and ability and the job that will make me the most money? And like, what does that graph look like? And I'm going to pick that thing. And that was um, medicine. So I, I'm, I'm gifted in um, the sciences. Uh, I, I am a good, uh, I have a good bedside manner. Um, I'm intelligent. So that was kind of where I landed. I'm like, I'm going to be not just a doctor. I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon and do sports medicine. Whoa. So I enrolled in this athletic training program, pre-med program, had this really rigorous course load. Um, and everybody was so proud during that time in my life, right? Um, my girlfriend was proud. This is my boyfriend. He's going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'd look at like salary projections. I worked at the physical therapy clinic and, and gym. I was a personal trainer. Everybody's so proud. And I hated it. Yeah. You know, you're successful, but I hated it. Like I was breaking out in hives every night because I was so stressed out. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I just kept going back to like, this isn't fulfilling what I'm meant to do. Um. And I realized that like what gave me life was ministry and sharing the greatest thing that I knew with other people, which is the experience I had with the Black Eyed Peas. I'm like, yeah. I found this thing that changed my life, this music that that really, it, it did. Like I, it pulled me out of a really dark place because I had this positive thing to listen to and this and this thing that was meaningful to be a part of that that um, that I was able to 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 share with the world. And when I rediscovered ministry, I was like, this is it. This is that same thing. But now this is the greatest thing. This is the thing that actually can transform people's lives. And and how would I, how could I not share this? And so for me, just the way I'm built, I'm like, that's what I have to do. Um, I have to I have to serve and share this message. And so then I dropped out of the program and everybody now suddenly is very scared. And my parents are like, why? How much will you make? I'm like, I don't know. Give me maybe, a mailbox. Maybe, maybe nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my dad punched a mailbox. <laughs> he begged me to be a nurse because, yeah. because they're not because they were, are anti faith. They're they're faithful For people, sure. but they love me and they're like, but this isn't the cross section. Totally get it. Yeah, of uh, of who you are and what you're supposed to be. And yeah, um, but yeah, that that mindset of like, I found this thing that's so cool, and I need to share that. Well, I even think the advice you got from Will Adams is his last name. Yeah, Will. Will, Will I am. Yeah, yeah. Will Adams from yeah. w- from I, Will. Uh, <laughs> It matches even with this career. It's like to keep moving forward. Well, like this always higher journey that we're on of our mm-hmm. faith isn't ever that you made it or you produced it or it's online or you went to it. You know, it goes back to the yeah. first show we did with you. You know, it's the idea that you're always in a state of trying to move forward in that relationship and go through your conversion, your revival. So, Will, like I said, feel free to reach, reach out. out. We would consider having you on the show. and <laughs> We'll consider having you on the show if we don't have any guests. We'll well, and, yeah, you know. If there's an opening, yeah. Yeah. We just, I don't know how you're pulling in Australia. Um, <laughs> what have you done now? You have this like creative outlet, right? You've built things, you've written things. You, you're an ex- you express yourself. I know you're a speaker, but um, I think walking in here, I found out you've written a few things too. Tell me about that. Yeah, I've written a couple books, which yeah? uh, big shout out to my freshman English teacher, Mr. Scott, who probably would have never thought yes. that that would happen. Uh, I love to write, I love to speak. Um, and I've written several books, uh, one book on humility, which is a fun book to try to promote. Yep. Um, <laughs> the best book on humility. It around. really is. like, <laughs> And when you tell people about it, their faces get so sour. Like we are so afraid of humility. So people oh, and we romanticize yeah. writing a book. So when people say you say, hey, I'm writing a book, people are like, oh, my gosh, you're writing a book. Do you wear a sweater? By the tell lake? me about that. <laughs> like, it's just people. Because people, a lot of people like don't necessarily like to write, or they had bad experiences in English class, and so it's very romantic. And then, what's your book about? And it's about the lineage of humility. And if they're they're Catholic, especially, they're like, "Oh no, I'm not touching. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. You stay. You're gonna ruin." I have one person say, "I'm not reading your book. It'll ruin my life. <laughs> it will ruin my life if I read your book on humility." And um, Ooh. but I, that's my that's one of the favorite things I've, I've written. I've written on discernment, um, on how we we begin new things and how those those new things can draw us closer to Jesus, um, on authentic masculinity. I love to write. That's awesome. Can you I put you on the spot for a minute? But um, I'll, this concept of discernment 
A is a very Catholic thing to say. When I talk mm-hmm. about it in other groups, they think it's neat, but they're like, tell me more. Can you talk to, to just the general audience? There's plenty of non-Catholics that listen or people that are Catholic and still don't get this. How do you describe discernment? How do you describe going from not knowing to being called and not, not just trying to show up for what your parents expect or being greatly recruited to something? Like, what does discernment look like? And uh, in 33 words. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 33 <laughs> words to discernment glory. <laughs> I have an idea for That's, a new book. <laughs> I mean, by the way, that is one of the shortest devotionals you can ever yeah, do. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but you, it's still a full price book. It's, <laughs> yep. That's it. Yep. <laughs> There's a lot of four words. There's, a four, but there's four words with the four words. Four, <laughs> forward, four words. <laughs> forward, four words. Ah. <laughs> a discernment is the ability to listen and respond to the interior movements of the Holy Spirit in our heart. Mm. And I think that that requires a couple of things that we say the word, but it requires a, a spiritual effectiveness, affectiveness, mm. um, and an emotional affectiveness because the Lord uses both of those things. And it's the ability to sit in those moments and then dialogue with them. Okay, real quick, just for anybody who doesn't know, what does what is the affect or what does affective mean versus effective? Yeah, af- so that that's like the, my 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 affections, how I feel the the movements in my heart. So if you watch the first um, the first ten minutes of Up, mm. I have an affective response to that. I have, I I feel something. Yeah, uh, it moves something. It stirs something in me. Yeah, and the Lord uses that. I think one fallacy in discernment is like I have to be stoic, and there's this movement, especially with men, towards stoicism of like. Very, very even keeled. And I think there can be value to that. Sure. At times. But to read yeah. the emotional response to things, especially if I'm in a state of grace. I think that's the other key. If I'm in a if I'm praying, if I'm staying connected to the Lord, I have to look at how I'm responding to things and then how those things linger. So that was my thing with ministry and how I knew that that's where I was being called in college is <laughs> when I would go to my classes at school and I'd get uh I got like 102% on my anatomy final, which nobody in the class got that. So I felt in the moment, great. So proud, so excited. I crushed that final. I had the flu before it, and I was hallucinating that my body was exploding. And to put it back together, <laughs> I had to had to name each bone. Dude, it was weird. Wow. I studied so hard for this exam, right? I'd like, but that left me. Yeah, like I was not... proud for a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was back to nothing. But when I'd go and do youth ministry at the parish on Sunday night, I had a sustainable joy that lasted until Wednesday. It's very Ignatian, too, right it's, there. It is. Yeah, yeah. Hey, exactly. Is yeah. How, what is my affective response to this? Um, and being attention to those movements. And I just uh, want to jump in. I had a similar, like, I remember I was in, everybody's like, oh, accounting is going to be really hard when you get there and blah, blah, blah. And it, it got, got, got build up, built up in my own brain. And I was like, at this point of discernment of like, what am I supposed to be right, college? Like, yeah. what am I supposed to be? Where am I supposed to be? Uh, and then I got a hundred on the first test. I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to be an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't leave me. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing. And that's it's, the thing. it's, it's that's different cool. for everybody. Yeah. And I think like that's that's the challenge with discernment, especially as men, is we're like, how oh, we gotta like it's not always logical. And yeah. and that's that's the other challenge with it. Is like sometimes it is and and one mode of discernment is making a list of pros and cons and then looking at it and saying, Okay, but there are spiritual pros and cons. Like that's the thing that people mm. always get wrong about discernment is they'll be like, Okay, what are the pros and cons of taking a new job? What are the spiritual pros and cons? Oh. Well, my new job is for a company that is morally bankrupt. That's a big spiritual con. Yeah. You know? Um one of my favorite modes of discernment uh, that Saint Ignatius talks about is at the end of your life, standing before the judgment throne of God, how will you reflect on this decision? Yeah. What will you wish that you told him you did? Because that's the other thing. Like our our decisions have eternal eternal weight Just to them. Bring those cupcake questions in here, Joel. Joel, I think <laughs> how will you feel on the judgment seat? <laughs> yeah, what's what's before maybe an Lord. easier question we could ask that makes us feel better in the moment and uh, <laughs> Let's us just justify our decisions. Yeah. Where do you want to go on vacation? <laughs> I mean, that's, in fairness, St. Ignatius says that if you really are having trouble reading the movements and if all other modes of discernment have failed, that you go to that. That's kind of like the last mm. resort. Okay, that's, know? yeah, and I'm sure that's consoling for, you know, some of our crowd who's like, whoa, that's that's hard hitting. But yeah, I mean, so that you can, maybe with some of these smaller decisions especially, or at least next step yeah. decisions, it's like, okay, well, 
is there a peace about this or exactly. is there is there a joy about this? And sometimes it happens in the moment. Like the first mode of discernment is just spontaneous discernment. Like when I don't tell this story often and I'm going to tell it on a podcast because I don't want people to misread it. So I should say I don't tell this to teenagers. Okay. But the moment I met my wife, when I first saw her, I knew I was going to marry her. Amen. Me too. It was this moment. Of, yeah. And so you have that where I'm like, that's the one. That's spontaneous discernment. St. Matthew, when Jesus called him away from his tax collection, it was spontaneous discernment. I just know. And sometimes that happens. Other times it's reading the the emotional consolation, the spiritual consolation, and or or dryness, and using that to discern. And and sometimes it's just breaking down the spiritual pros and cons. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be any of those things, and it's it's a little bit different on the circumstance. But uh, you're knowing how very to do that's good at describing this in the most practical, yeah, tangible ways. Sure. And you did at one point say it doesn't have to make sense, so that also helps me in my soul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Um, I'm ready to write your forward anytime you want. It's just going to say, I like Joel's book. I, I would appreciate That's that. Four, yeah. words. Four, words. Four, words. Four, words. four words. And it's going to be called Four Words because he'll write four words. He'll write four words. Like we can fill up. I would love that. A third of a page. That would be great. <laughs> Spaces and titles. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Indentations. What's the name of the book on discernment? It's called True North, A Roadmap for Discernment. Yeah. Man, you can get that one at lifeteen.com. It's a great book for, I mean, anybody of any age. So even though it's through that. A teen site, it's a, it's a good one. I like how you don't tell that to teenagers. You just don't want them falling in love right there. I, because, the, yeah, because yeah. you tell that to teenagers, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're like, and I, I saw am, her, I'm I knew. getting married. You will have a 16-year-old boy who says and does dumb things, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> I saw you across the room there during, Lord, I lift your name on high. And, and I discerned and I marriage. I discerned. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the tough thing. Discernment <laughs> happens. Often in community, like like as as a married sure, man, sure. I can't discern. I can't go to my wife and say I've discerned this, mm. and we're going to do it unless I really feel strongly. Ninety nine percent of my decisions have to be I've I've prayed about this. What's your prayer saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. which I think is a good reminder. I can actually remember this happening with a couple of guys, um, or at least there were there were stories about this when I was at A and M, where it was like a guy would approach a girl and say, "I think God wants us to date." Don't put that on God. I know. Like, don't make God your wingman. Well, well, and also like the pressure that that then puts on the lady. Like, oh well, so am I? Am I denying God if I deny this guy? Like, I mean, it's this weird. I'm not saying these guys meant it as a manipulation, but it can it be is. a very. And don't do it. Well, yeah, you should and, own your words. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that at that point, we we like organizational development stuff. We're organizational yeah. guys. I think at this point, it's worthwhile stopping if there are priests listening to this and say, "You're laughing about a guy at A and M doing that. Don't do that to your staff." Don't do that mm. to your, Ooh, your people yeah. as a priest. And again, as, a, as a, a leader in the church, I think this is one of the challenges is we also have to have people we discern with, whether that's a leadership team. And they can be tough because when you're a spiritual head, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a, a husband is, it can be like, why my way or the high way? And you got to discern with your wife. Yeah. Same mm-hmm. thing as a spiritual leader of a parish. Do you have people around you that when you're discerning a decision, you can say, I've been praying about this is where I feel. What's your prayer been? You know, and you can trust that those people are in a state of grace and are able to help you bounce, refine the idea, even putting it in like the, you know, the, the Steve Jobs analogy of the rock tumbler. Uh, that can be discernment in a group too. And it's it's key in parishes. And oftentimes leadership doesn't doesn't always do that. And it's not because of a, a pride. I think it's just a fear of like, does that make me seem weak, you know, mm, as a pastor, sure. as a leader? Uh, and it doesn't. It, it makes you strong because you then can make a strong decision. And that's chapter seven in his book on humility. <laughs> you know, Joel, I think we've converted you because you don't say Texas A and M. You just say A and M. I did. I yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, There's no, no need. I've been here in Dallas too long. <laughs> no need to explain. And I did it again. <laughs> it's yeah. Dallas, Oregon, everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very small town in Oregon. By the way, you're in Las Colinas, so yeah. that we don't even have to say anything else. You're in yeah, Las Colinas. That's all you got to know. So that's my funny part because. Awesome. You are now converted. You don't need to just move your family here. We're happy to have you. You're Oftentimes when I'm in tech and when I'm in Dallas specifically, I'm like, I can live here. Yeah, you can. Go yeah. Cowboys. We'll mm, figure that out. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Last, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> mm. he meant the other Cowboys. The actual, like, literal. People riding. Yeah. yeah. So uh, last question maybe to uh, wrap this up because you've written three books and we're going to cover all three of them in one shebang. Uh, w- talk to us for a second because there's people listening who – they just listen because we're so funny. Um, <laughs> there's other people that listen for other reasons. Yes. And there's one woman in Australia that <laughs> listens because this is the only podcast she can download. She hasn't figured out how to download anything else. <laughs> Onto her recording device. Well, she lives by a Cracker Barrel. <laughs> yeah, she gets the tapes. Uh, the question I have is for these. The crogs. <laughs> 
walking around. So the question I have seriously uh, is there are men listening to this show who have either fallen away are very lazy in their faith, really just kind of like along for the ride. You talk about masculinity. What is a, a core message you could leave us with? And I'm kind of just putting you on the spot here, but you've written a book about it, so you better mm-hmm. be good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> about God just, told me he wants you to answer this question. <laughs> But well, no pressure. Well, gosh, that's so well played. That's so well Man, played. I want a hard nick for that comment. Yeah, that was really good. See. The callbacks abound. Yeah, you better watch both episodes if you want to know what we're even yeah, doing here. Which, yeah, yeah. We, if we need to rewatch that first step. Anyway, keep going. Masculinity. Yes. Yeah. I, I think every man, regardless of if he's religious or not, um, desires to know who he is and, and what his identity is is and to find that and our identity is uniquely situated in who we were created to be and who god created to be so it's a uniquely religious thing but men were created to, cr- to be creative creatures to be protective creatures and to cultivate and those are three things that that come from you know we understand in a religious tradition from you know the truth of the genesis story of the creation of adam he was you know given the power to create um you know one through life but man man, man is a creative force um to cultivate a garden and to protect it um, and for any man, and this is what I would challenge you with, if you've fallen away and you're like, I don't know about living the faith or about, about, you know, if, if God is real, strive to live those three things every day, do something creative. What do you create? Some men build, some men write, some men speak, some men, uh, serve. What is your creative force? You know, I think sometimes we reduce that to, you know, purely like, well, I, man, man can create life. You know, we can, we can have children, but it's bigger than that. That's definitely a huge part of it. You know, what are you cultivating? Are you cultivating virtue? What habits do you cultivate? A man has to be working towards something so he doesn't become stagnant. That's why work is so important. And then what are you protecting? Are you leaning into your garden to protect your family, uh, your, your, your coworkers? A man is, is supposed to be a protective being. And when we don't, the distortions of those things are why our, our culture falls apart. Men who don't create but destroy. And because just as we have a capacity to be creative, uh, we destroy. There's a, the phrase in Latin, which I, I can't say in the Latin, but I'll give you the English translation, mm-hmm. which is the corruption of the best things are the worst things. Mm. And we see, mm. pick anything. Yeah. If you corrupt that good thing, it becomes a bad thing. Well, that's the, the story of Lucifer, right? It is. He was the yeah. highest the of the good angels. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but take, but think uh, you can, any application. That's why, you know, a scandal in the church is worse than a scandal at a college because the church is higher. It's yeah. a good thing. And so when it's corrupted, it's an even worse thing. Um, when we don't cultivate virtue, we cultivate vice. And then if we're not protecting something, we're apathetic. And and that apathy is where I think a lot of men find themselves. And I, I guess the, sort of the challenge is lean into those three areas and then recognize that, that's, that you have a creator that made you that way in God's image and likeness. And he desires you to find the fullness of who you are in those pieces. Um, and it's simple. They're practical things, but they're life-changing things. Again, I just have to ask, are there easier questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's no. that is beautiful. That's incredible. A month ago we were talking about gamma squeezes and I just my stock on you is going through the roof and I just want to give you a squeeze. Oh, that we that's got right. Uh, that's right. Awesome. <laughs> no, that's so good. We so could good. pivot the table for you yes. to make it easier. We could pivot table. Okay, Joel. <laughs> Sorry, I had to like repeat myself. That's a terrible joke if you have to <laughs> explain it. You're incredible. Thank you. Yeah, thank because you. God is working through you and because you Praise are you are cultivating that virtue and you are being a man. So thank you for being that example. Um, if people want to connect with you, they should, first of all, follow the National Eucharistic Congress they Revival. Mm-hmm. But what about these books? Are these Amazon books we can go find? Yeah, you can find uh, the books are on Amazon um, or Ave Maria Press is where okay. I have a couple published or lifeteam.com is where you can find them. And then you can follow me on um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and TikTok. At, uh, that was amazing. The way you just <laughs> completely <laughs> apologized with your facial expression for saying those words. You can find me there at <laughs> Chasing Humility, which is an easy one to remember. At Chasing Humility, it's also the name on of my, one of my books. On TikTok. <laughs> okay, we'll see you all uh, in the irony of the social media world. <laughs> no, yes, brother, we, we love you. Thank you for being yeah. a part. Thank you for having me. The this greatest part of our show is our guests and what they bring to Absolutely. everybody out there and the Australians. So thank you for all you're doing, mm-hmm. and we will see the rest of you. In the Eucharist. God bless you. (laughs) You. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to join us at our undersized table, subscribe to the video version of the show on YouTube by typing at 
that's the symbol at, so shift and two on your keyboard, at the underscore Beatitudes on YouTube. We'll see you there. This podcast is part of the Spoke Street Network. For more great podcasts, visit Spokestreet.com.